30th December 1911, the paper hits the floor. On page number 6 is an ad from the Australian military. Department of Defence, Melbourne, 23rd of December 1911. Appointment of two competent machinists and aviators. Applications from expert machinists and aviators. Desirous of being appointed to the Defence Department. Will be received by the Secretary, Department of Defence, Victoria Barrack, Melbourne. Or the High Commissioner for Australia, 78 Victoria Street, Westminster, London, WC. Up to an inclusive of Thursday, the 1st of February 1912. Candidates must state nature of qualifications and experience. Military experience, if any, whether born or domiciled in Australia. Age, whether married or single. Salary to be the rate of £400 per annum, inclusive of all allowances except travelling. The Commonwealth Government will not accept liability for accidents. A successful candidate will be appointed for 12 months on probation, upon conclusion of which, if their service has been satisfactory, their appointment may be confirmed. S.A. Penbridge, Secretary. Hello guys and girls, how's it going? Screezilla here and I hope you're all well and you join me today in Rise of Flight. Now I'm flying for the Royal Flying Corps of Australia and today I'm going to be talking about the start of the uh, Australian aviation basically, the, the first uh, time that Australia got up into the skies. Um, it's rather poignant on today, of course, being Anzac Day, so it is a very important day for the Australian military. So we'll be taking off momentarily. Okay, let's start. On the 3rd of July 1912, two flying machines are ordered. Two Royal Aircraft Factory BE-2 twin-seat and two British-built De Poisson single-seat monoplanes. On the 6th of August that year, Henry Peter was appointed as pilot. Peter, born in 1980, sorry, in 1884, 1984, that would be a bit awkward, uh, was a solicitor. Born of his legal career, he left and started his passion with aircraft, building his own aeroplane and then commissioned as a lieutenant for the Australian military forces. He helped choose Australia's first air base at Point Cook in Victoria and started the first training institution. Major Peter passed away at the age of 77 in 1962. He had a distinguished military career and was considered the father of the military aviation, sorry, the father of military aviation in Australia. Interesting tidbit, he actually married uh, Kate Free, aka Peter, a racing driver from Canada. She raced for, fair, she actually raced in a fair few uh, pre-war Grand Prix until an accident with Reg Parnell, uh, the team manager of, of uh, Aston Martin, that got their legendary win at Le Mans, uh, crashed into her, ending her career behind the wheel. Uh, she remained as a journalist and finally worked for Austin, where she designed some of the interior for the iconic Mini. Um, they would have met probably at the Brooklyn's racetrack uh, and aerodrome. Uh, it was very likely that Henry was flying and she was racing at the time. On the 11th of August, Eric Harrison was accepted as the second pilot for the new unit. Group Captain Harrison was the first Australian to fly, the, to fly for the military. Um, he was the first, as the first plane of the Central Flying School took off in March of 1914. As the First World War broke out, Harrison led the first official mission for the flying unit, taking one BE-2 to Rabul in New Guinea, which was held by the Germans at that time. With little resistance to Australian naval and military expeditionary forces, it was over so fast that they did not even have time to assemble the plane. Group Captain Harrison, sorry, Group Captain Harrison did not have much taste of combat, but he was the backbone of the Australian Flying Corps. He had a great mechanical knowledge, initiating the build of aero engines in Australia. At some stages, he was the only one keeping some of the obsolete planes at Point Cook in the air. He became an air crash invest investigator in the military and was the founding member of the R one of the founding members of the RAAF, the Royal Australian Air Force. 
who left the military in 1938 and sadly passed away suddenly at the age of 59 from a heart failure. He was considered the father of the RAA, the RAAF, until the title was given fully to Air Marshal Sir Richard Williams. Now, with the basic areas set, the start of the Australian Air Force was not was now in motion. Originally named the AAC, Australian Aviation Corps, it was not until 1914 that it got its name as the Australian Flying Corps, called the AFC, which it would be known as until 1919 when it was named the AIC, Australian Air Corps. Um, not sure why an I stands for A, uh, but oh well. Um, which was then renamed the RAAF in 1922, the Royal Australian Air Force. The first operational flight for the AEC occurred on the 27th of May 1915, when the Mesopotamian half flight, the MHF, under the command of Captain Henry Peter, was placed to assist the Indian Army in protecting the British oil interests in Mesopotamia, uh, modern day Iraq. The MHF had to operate a mixture of many different planes, mainly for reconnaissance roles at first. They did later go on to um, do some bombing runs and also other interesting parts later in the war. One issue was that some of the aircraft such as the Maurice Fairman Shorthorns and Longhorns supplied by the Indian government were obsolete before they even took flight really, and were not fit for desert conditions. The planes only had a top speed of 50 miles per hour, which was an issue when the Schmal, uh, which is basically a very high desert wind um, in Mesopotamia and in Iraq, of course, reaching speeds of up to 80 miles per hour stirred up, which meant sometimes the planes would actually be blowing backwards or stationary in the air. They did have the option of the Pulsion G3, which was faster but prone to breaking down a lot. One was forced to land behind enemy lines, pilot George Mers and New Zealand officer W.A. Byrne were never seen again. There were reports of them running and gunning with the local Arabs with a gun battle that covered over several miles. The squadron now moved to Kurt, where equipped with the Martinside S-1s and were renamed the number 1st squadron of the Royal Flying Corps. They remained there for some time. While there, Henry Peter actually developed, in typical Anzac ingenuity, a retooled garden rake that allowed him to measure distance to the ground from the air in a much more accurate fashion, which led to him making much more accurate maps, which in turn helped the Indian forces on the ground. Sadly, however, after the Indian forces met, or forces met stiff opposition at Baghdad, they fell back to Kut, which fell under siege. Between December of 1915 and April of 1916, Number 30 Squadron flew many missions using crude homemade parachutes to airdrop supplies of grain and millstones, along with medical supplies, equipment and ammunition. After five months under siege, the garrison at Kurt surrendered. Nine Australian Flying Corps members, uh, group staff, sorry, ground staff, were still in the city and captured. They were forced marched back to Turkey, where all but two of the men survived captivity. Henry Peter was now the last remaining Australian airman, airman in uh, Mesopotamia. He disbanded from number 30 squadron and flew the last remaining short 827 Shorthorn to Egypt, where he would rejoin the Australian Flying Corps. Now the short 827 was actually a flying boat, uh, it had pontoons on it. Um, However, the shorthorn variant had the pontoons removed so it could work on land. They were originally going to use it in the, uh, the, name of the river, but the river near Kut, um, and use it as a river plane. But the dry bumps had actually dried the river up so much they couldn't land the plane in this river. The Mesopotamian half flight was officially disbanded in October of 1916. There were a total of nine pilots who flew with the unit. Two were MIA, presumed killed in action. Six were captured. Only Captain Henry Peter made it out of the area. Sadly, overshadowed by the public's interest in the events at Gallipoli, the half-flight's heroic and pioneering achievements and bravery went largely unrecognised. The tale of Australia's first operational flying unit is one that is rather unknown. A small ragtag bunch of men, without with out-of-date planes, fighting with fellow Commonwealth soldiers, 
in one of the hardest areas and conditions of war, the desert was not a very nice place and caused many problems for the Anzac troops there, especially the Flying Corps. As the world thinks of the First World War, they think of rainy trenches of the Western Front, but there were far more theatres. It was not until late 1917 that the Anzacs came to Europe. Now, one of the problems the Anzacs had, uh, especially the, um, the half-flight, was those desert conditions. The planes they had were not fit for them, and they really did struggle. They had a terrible time trying to actually get um, get everything working. The planes would overheat constantly and just would not work when they needed them to. The other problem, of course, was uh, water. Um, they really did have a problem of keeping the planes cool. Now, oil would overheat, water would overheat, um, fuel would uh, evaporate. You know, there were all these problems that these guys had and they did an amazing job of keeping it all going. The sad part of the Mesopotamian half-flight is it was Australia's first time in the air theatre. Um, they had more Obviously, afterwards, the uh, number one squadron moved to Egypt, and that's where uh, Captain Henry Peter ended up going to. He flew to Egypt and caught up with number one squadron. And with them, he actually continued, continued the war. Um, I wanted to mention the two pilots that basically started it all, because really, they did start the Australian Flying Corps which is crazy, you know, you've got two pilots, they basically only had two planes, um, they had the two single-seaters and the two, um, two twin-seaters. Many of the pilots only received about 12 hours solo flight before they were thrown into the war itself. It's just crazy to think about it. They really did have a tough time. Of course, the other issue for Australia was they were just so far away from everything as well. And it did often cause serious problems uh, for getting things over there. As you see with my Royal Flying Corps members is there, flying underneath me. Um, let's continue on. So, with the Royal Flying Corps throughout the war, a total of 880 officers were commissioned and 2,840 other staff served for the Australian Flying Corps. Of that number, only 410 were pilots, and 153 were observers, of course, and rear gunners and, you know, spotters, things like that. 200 more served as aircrew for the Royal Flying Corps of Britain. So, you had around about 353 um, sort of observers and gunners, things like that, serving from Australia, from the Commonwealth there. It's very low numbers in all honesty, but one of the issues is Australia has a very low number of population as well. It did make the horrific losses for the Australians. Of that number, 175 were killed, 111 wounded, 6 were gassed, and 40 captured. And the vast majority of these casualties were suffered at the end of the war in the Western Front, where the Australians had 78 deaths, 68 wounded and 33 prisoners of war. This was a casualty rate of 44%, a rate which was only marginally lower than that of the Anzac infantry units at the time in the trenches. It's nigh on impossible to think of a casualty rate of 44%. Some of the um, some of the infantry units were suffering up to 55 to 60 percent casualty rates, which is just horrific. Um, it's just near no and impossible to think about. Um, as I say, the last year of the war it was the 100 basically the last 100 days of the war. Um, the Australians lost around 78 people, which. When you look at the numbers, 175 were killed in total, 78 of those were in the last year of the war. And that is because they were doing things like I'm doing right now. 
the Australians were mainly used for ground attacks, and that caused a lot of problems, because when you're ground attacking you are very vulnerable to, of course, aircraft fire, but also anti-aircraft fire, light arms fire from the ground. Now, many of the Australians were lost because they were hit from uh, below, from ground fire, much like the Red Baron, um, whose death it was recently, over the fat anniversary of his death. Um, many believe he was taken out by an Australian gunner from the ground, you know, and this is what happened to a lot of these Australian pilots. It wasn't in glorious dogfights above the trenches, it was being hit from below the ground by shrapnel or by a stray bullet. Now, despite all of this, the Australian Flying Corps' four operational squadrons claimed 527 enemy aircraft kills, and the Australian Air Flying Corps had a total of 57 aces, where... Sorry, 57 aces at the end of the war, one of whom was Melbourne-born Henry Colby, uh, who became the top ace for the Australian Flying Corps. Despite serving for less than a year, he joined number 4 squadron with only 12 hours of solo flying experience in February of 1918. He downed his first German plane. Uh, he flew against the famous Red Bar the famous uh, Richthofen's Flying Circus. Uh, he ended the war with uh, 24 aircraft kills and 5 balloon kills, so a grand total of 29 kills, making him Australian Flying Corps' only balloon busting ace as well. He also had the honour of leading the first Australian Flying Corps Anzac Day fly past over London on the 25th of April 1919. He said that he performed some rather risky stunts which caused the Prince of Wales to be alarmed, as they were very low over his head. He said he was so low at some point he was at risk of nicking his plane as an undercarriage from one of the soldiers' bayonets. The Australian Flying Corps members were awarded one Victoria Cross and 40 received Distinguished Flying Crosses. Two of the members of the Australian Flying Corps received three of these victories. Now as you see here I'm very alarmed doing strafe runs. Uh, I've managed to take out a couple of ground vehicles with, the, with uh, my bombs and I'm going in for basically strafing runs here. And this is the real dangerous part of um, the flying because, well, you're very low to the ground, so you've got to try and get those guns on target while zooming into a car in a plane that doesn't handle very well. Again, this is where the majority of injuries, losses, and um, deaths, unfortunately, were, were would happen for the Australian flyers. Now, of course, the, what the Australian uh, Flying Corps went on to be the RAAF, of course, and the Royal Australian Air Force have a very proud tradition. Now, one thing before we finish, I just want to talk a little bit about the occupation of the um, foot. While it was being occupied, um, uh, Henry Peter was one of the people doing the airdrops, and it was all made up. Now here I'm coming into a triple A nest and try and get some shots on target. There's a balloon there. Um, and yet yeah, he had to improvise with the parachutes. Um, just the fact that these guys had to make do a mend on the fly is just some of the most amazing stuff that you can think of. Um, I ask that today we allow a moment to thank our servicemen and women for what they do. Uh, here in Australia we'll be paying our respects and eating our Anzac biscuits of course, thinking of the brave men and women who left their land to fight the war on foreign shores. I do hope you found this video interesting. Um, I just wanted to do something on the history of the Royal Flying Corps and on the Anzacs themselves. Um, it's a subject that is quite near and dear to my heart, of course, now I live in Australia. Um, but the Commonwealth soldiers have always been something that have uh, really been very close to my heart. Because generally they, they left their lands to fight on foreign soil and didn't come home. 
and that I always find very sad. Now here we're going to see the perils of strafing ground targets. So we go in for the strafe and we get our engine nicked. And that's the end of us. We're going to have to head home. And this, as I say, was the biggest problem in for the Australians uh, with their ground attack runs. Because they were mainly doing these ground attack runs, they were constantly being hit by these uh, AAA guns. Now, the AAA guns at the time were not the, the behemoths that we think of in the Second World War. They weren't these big 88mm flak guns. They were, you know, 7.7mm guns, sometimes sort of 20mm guns, things like that. But mainly it was just rifle fire from the trenches, things like that. It was so dangerous for these guys. And the, the loss rate and the, the bravery shown is just outstanding. As I said, there were only um, 410 pilots for the Australian Flying Corps. And you have to consider the Australian Flying Corps was brand new at the start of the war and they claimed 527 enemy aircraft. So they really did outperform themselves and do a fantastic job. Okay guys, well I'm going to end this video here, I do hope you enjoyed it. Please give a like, comment and subscribe if you did, and let me know down below any stories you'd like to share. Until next time, this is me, Screws on out. Bye bye. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun, and in the morning, we will remember them. Least we forget. Come on, come on, I'll be fine. I can land this. I'm doing good. Okay, just pull it up a bit. Pull it up a bit. We're okay. We're okay. It's all good. It's all it's not good. Bugger. Well I'm gonna shoot the ground.